First question from Rex Stoddard with Golf Channel. Rex, go ahead. Hey, Jay, how are you? Good, Rex, how are you? Well, uh, if you'd like to follow up on the last part of your comments there about harassing behavior, I think it's what you said, as it applies to the very real world situation with Bryson. Would, would Brooksy, would that qualify as harassing behavior? I'm sorry, you broke up there. Sorry, uh, would Brooksy classify it as harassing behavior when it's said to Bryson on the golf course? Yes. And the reason I say yes is, you know, the barometer that sh we, we, we are all using is the word respect. And to me, when you hear Brooksy yelled or you hear any expression yelled, the question is that respectful or disrespectful? That has been going on for an extended period of time. To me, at this point, it's disrespectful. And that's the kind of behavior that we're not going to tolerate going forward. Thank you. Next question from Bob Herrick with ESPN. Hey, good morning, Jay. Good morning, um, Bob. Uh, to follow up on that, um, have you talked with Bryson and Brooks, and have you asked them to sort of ratchet down the, you know, the kind of the back and forth that's uh, that's going on here for the last few months? I've had conversations with, uh, with both players. Uh, Bob, you know, these observations go back to pre-COVID uh, as it relates to general concern around code of conduct at our tournaments. And they certainly exist prior to uh, that analysis that the team had led. And so, and I've been out over the last, at a lot of our tournaments this year, particularly since our return to play. And, you know, this issue isn't, isn't specific to one or two players. I think it's an opportunity to reassess overall civility at our tournament and fan behavior and reset, uh, reset uh, the expectation through our fan code of conduct. That's something that we have identified. It's something that I've talked to not only those two players, but a lot of our players about. It's something I've talked to our, our partners in the industry about and we've all agreed that together, we've got to come, to get, come together and, and demonstrate what is truly exceptional about our game. And if you go back to the history of the game, the values uh, of honor, integrity, respect uh, that have been central fabric to the game since the point in time, our expectation is that that's what we're going to experience at our tournaments. And I made the point earlier about, you know, about you know, families and kids, and we have volunteers that are giving so much of their time, and the game has never had more people coming in to enjoy the game and experience it than we've had really over these last several months. And we want more people to come in. We just want to make certain that everybody can have a safe, healthy, and enjoyable experience, whether you're inside the ropes or outside the ropes. And that's what we're intending to do. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bob, next question from Bernie McGuire, Daily Record UK. Jay, hi, good morning. Good hey, to Bernie, see you. good to see you. Um, can, I, can I ask you a question with your European Tour um, board hat on? Mm -hmm. well, and without stating the obvious, what's the benefit for the European Tour players playing in the co-sanctioned events in the States, apart from the obvious of getting a tour code? And on the back of that question, Jay, if I may, um, there was a bit of talk about the fact that the Scottish Open is probably one of the premier events of the European Tour. But the two co-sanctioned events, without taking anything away from those two events, they're, they're sort of on a lesser scale than, say, a memorial or an at and Pebble Beach or a sort of, you know, a, a Genesis Invitational. So I'm just wondering whether, in going forward, can we see events of the Statue of the Scottish Open being co-sanctioned with those bigger events on the PGA Tour? Well, Bernie, good to see you again. Thanks for the question. I think, you know, putting my European Tour board hat on, uh, I think you have to look at the Scottish Open and the Barracuda and Barbasol events as a collective. Um, and I think that the, the Scottish Open itself, with inclusion of half of the field of PGA Tour members and the strength of the field that the European Tour brings to that event, uh, I think puts us in a position where you've got a great fan for players, a great event, excuse me, for players, 
uh, for fans. Uh, and you've got an event that now has a great runway thanks to the, uh, the sponsorship uh, by Genesis of the Scottish Open. And then I think that when you look at those two weeks, and you look at those two events now where you've got 50 players that will be participating from the European tour. Uh, those players not be, m most of those players not competing during those two weeks. It gives them an opportunity to come, to come play in those two events to enhance their position as European tour members. Uh, should they win, it, it gives them the opportunity to pot potentially pursue a career on the PGA Tour. Um, and, and ultimately, I think for the world to see PGA Tour, European Tour play, players playing together back to back in these opposite events uh, with more high quality fields than we've had in the past here or the PGA Tour has had in the past, I think is a positive all the way around. And as it relates to any future scenarios, you guys are far better at the hypotheticals than I am. But this is just, the, you know, this is, as I've said, this is just the start of our alliance. It's a demonstration of what we can and will do together, um, you know, and, and we're spending a lot of time together thinking about what those other opportunities might look like, what a future product model looks like, and I'm excited to get to, to Wentworth next, next week to, to be with Keith and the team. Okay, thanks for your time this morning too, Jack. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Next up, we have Shane Ryan from Golf Digest. Uh, hello, Jay. Thanks Hi, for Shane. taking the question. Of course. Thank you. Uh, so, while stating the obvious that the pandemic is not over yet, uh, so far we're you know a year and a half into it, and I think anyone would fairly judge that the PGA Tour has come through with flying colors. But I would like to ask you, you know, going back to the spring and summer of 2020. It wasn't at all clear that things would go this well. Things were really uncertain. Um, and hopefully this question is easier to answer now, but I'd like to know what were the most challenging moments? Uh, what time period was, I don't know if scary is the word, but you know, challenging and uncertain, uh, just to get a peek behind what you guys were all doing at that point. Well, I, I, you know, to, you, to the first part of your question, we're still going through it and we're still not without our challenges and we're still looking at those challenges day to day, market to market and making the best decisions we can alongside community partners, health officials and medical experts. But I, I think when you go back to that period of time, Shane, it's really hard to pinpoint one particular moment because whether you're talking about when we stepped aside at the Players' Championship, whether you're talking about the 91 days between the Players' Championship and our return, and then when you're looking at those first five weeks, the reality is the PGA Tour, like every other organization, was dealing with a ton of uncertainty. And so I just go back to that entire period of time, and I'm proud of the way our team, our players, embraced the fact that we were dealing with uncertainty and working with our board, tried to just make steadily make rational decisions about our return to golf, always with health and safety as our number one priority. I, I, think, I think once you got into it, you, know, you never know how things are gonna work until you get into it. In our case, it was returning at Charles Schwab. Um, and then I think you know, up until Friday of, of, uh, of RBC Heritage, we, we, were, we didn't have any positive tests. And I think in the days and weeks that follow, we started to, to get some. And that entire period was gut-wrenching. Um, but, you know, we, we recognized that we were going to need to learn to live with this and we were going to need to continue to make adjustments as we went forward. And I think that we, I think that's exactly what we did. And uh, that's exactly what we'll continue to do as long as, you know, we're forced to, to continue to, you know, to deal with this pandemic. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Next up from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, a question from Steve Hummer. Jay, I'm just wondering, what are your uh, what are your concerns about having a player in Bryson who very well could win this thing and who is one of the, the biggest stars on tour, not uh, not communicating with the media now? And what are his responsibilities in, in addressing some of the issues that, that, that you've addressed as far as fantastic conduct or anything else that comes up along over the course of a tournament? Yeah, I, listen, I think that, um, 
as it relates to, you know, to Bryson. Listen, Bry Bryson is a star. He has fascinated golf and sport fans around the world since our return to golf. He's also a young man that's growing and evolving, not just on the golf course, but off the golf course. And, you know, I, I would just say to you that I look at this as a point in time. I don't think this is the way things are gonna be for a long period of time. I'm hopeful that we'll get back to, you know, a ready, re you know, a steady cadence of communication that he'll have with the media. But he's working through some things and he's gonna have my and our support as he continues to do so. And, and listen, I think that as it relates to, you know, general fan behavior and any individual's role in it, I, I take it, I take that on as an organi organizational responsibility. You know, we've had challenges in the past, we'll have challenges as we continue to go forward. And so long as we build the right systems, we effectively communicate with every one of our tournaments, we, we are planning and pre-planning effectively. Um, the, the, the marketplace knows the expectation when we're on site. I think, I think that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna get back to, you know, we're gonna get back to, you know, a great environment. We have a great environment. We'll continue to, continue to improve our environment at our tournaments going forward. Thank you, Steve. Next up, a question from Doug Ferguson with Associated Press. Jay, just to, just to follow up that, uh, from Bryson, do, do you think it's a bad look that the guy only shoots 59 and, and won't speak to the guy that wins the tournament, won't speak, and if you talk about that? I've talked to Bryson about a lot of things, and um, obviously our preference would be to, you know, to have him talking to the media, you know, and, 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 and on a regular basis, and certainly in that instance when he has, has a historic performance. Uh, but like I said, um, you know, we're in the situation we're in right now. I don't, I'm hopeful that that will not be the case uh, on a long-term basis. And I think that, you know, sometimes, Doug, you know, as hard as it is to, to, to contemplate and understand, I think human beings and individuals need some space. And I think that's what's going on right now. And as I said, I think when we look at this over the long run, I, I, I think that um, this is something that he'll, he'll get through, he'll get to the other side of, and he'll be better for it. Um, but that's, that's my perspective on it. It's not, it's not binary. He's, you know, he's, he's working through it in the way that he's, he feels is best for him. And he knows he has my and our support. Have you ever considered, as they do in tennis, any type of a fine uh, for, for players not fulfilling media obligations if they even are media obligations? I would just say to you, in any instance, um, we're always going to focus on the player, the relationship with the player, understanding the player, trying to work with them to get to um, the right place and try and understand what's going through their heads. And so a fine, uh, I'm not sure what that is going to do for us in the long run. Ultimately, we want the player presenting his best self when he's in front of the media, when he's in front of fans, and that's, that's ultimately the goal for any player that's in a situation like that. Actually, you're supposed to say we don't discuss disciplinary action, by the way. Up. I did. Next up, Daniel <laughs> Next up, Daniel Rappaport from Golf Digest. A non Bryson question. Uh, well, actually, I partially Bryson, but about, about golf. I think yeah, last week was the first time in Eagle Tour history that two guys finished 27 under or better in a 17 hole stroke play event. Obviously, there's been a ton of rain in the area. Can't really get courses firm, but like, is that is that too low? Is there a point where where the course not fighting back enough. What? We're an outdoor sport. We don't get to choose our conditions. When it rains like it rained the first two weeks and you put the best players in the world on any golf course, uh, they're going to have the upper hand. And that's what happened here. And the bottom line is, 
I look at those two weeks and my question is, how do you replicate that environment more often? We had two extremely compelling events that ended in playoffs. Um, and in the case this past week, I don't know if I've ever seen a, a conclusion to an event uh, in a playoff like the one that we saw. So, you know, you want these golf courses to, and the golf courses themselves, they want to have perfect weather coming in so that they can pre prepare the golf course in the best possible manner. Unfortunately, it's just, that's not always doable. Uh, I'm really proud of the teams that we have at Liberty National and at Caves Valley, the superintendents, the staff. It's just incredible that we were able to get those two events in in the manner that we did. And uh, you know I'm an optimist. I look at that situation and the, I got more text messages in the last couple weeks about those two events than I have in almost any event in a long period of time. Uh, they have captured the attention of everybody, and I think they serve us exceedingly well as we walk into this week's Tour Championship. Thank you. Thank you. Next question from Stacy Brown with Black Press of America. Hi, Commissioner. Hey, Stacy. Uh, two, two quick things. One, you talked about the success of, of this season. Um, do you recall going out on such a high note because Obviously, we were at the BMW uh, championships, and, and you can't uh, you can't pray for a better uh, scenario than what you guys uh, what the what the guys put on uh, there. And and the second thing is, I don't know if it's more of a question or a comment, but speaking of Bryson, isn't it so? I guess it is a question that, in his case, he's changed his entire philosophy, his approach to the game, and so he's undergone a lot of. Um, Evolution, if you will, the evolution of Bryce. Um, doesn't that play? Uh, do you believe that plays a factor in the quote-unquote behavior that uh, everyone's talking about? Yeah. Uh, well, on the, on the uh, on the first part of your question, Stacy, I think that um, you know these are these are extraordinary times, and as we come in here to this week. Um, I just can't wait to see what unfolds over the four days of competition. And for me, the pride I have is in every one of our players, every one of our tournaments, uh, thankful that we continue to be so welcomed in every community where we play, thankful the charity organizations we support, thankful for the way that we've worked together with our industry partners to, to grow our respective tours and events and grow our game. I'm thankful for the way people are embracing our game like never before. And this is the end to our season, um, our 2020-2021 season. And I'm excited to continue that momentum as we go into next year. Um, and any, any uh, we've had so many great years. Um, it's hard to compare one to another. Uh, but I, as I stand here today as the leader of this organization, Again, I'm really proud of everybody that's gotten us to this point, and it's a legions of, legion of people. And then, and then I, you know, I think I think that your your, your question uh, and observation is a good one. And you know, I, I don't I don't know if and I've been thinking a lot about this. I, I don't know since we returned to golf. I don't I don't know of a player that's gone through a metamorphosis like like Bryson has in such a short period of time and he's continuing to you know to push himself you know to challenge convince conventional wisdom to find unique ways to you know to you know to improve his game and, and create a difference in his game and um with it and with the you know with becoming a star a, star, a superstar a global presence um you know that that brings new responsibilities and that's not something everybody's prepared for in their life. That's something that you grow into. Um, and that's what he's doing. And by the way, he's done a lot of things exceptionally well. And you, know, you watch him interact with kids. You look, you look at the care he takes for, <laughs> you know, for, you know in, in, in youth golf. You know, look at him going out and competing in a long drive contest. You know, there's so many wonderful things he's doing to shine a light on our game. And to me, this is, and I know it feels bigger to everybody else in this call, in the grand scheme of things, this is, this is a moment in time 
and it's and it's it's not as large. And to me, it's something that he's gonna. He's he's doing so many wonderful things. I don't think it should take away from all that great work, and it's not going to. Thank you. Next question, back to Rex Haggard with Golf Channel. Jay, it's my understanding that the player impact program will run through the end of the year, that it won't be a season thing. And I'm just curious, without giving a specific example of a player, but I'm sure you've seen the list. Can you actually give me an example of maybe content or an engagement that counts as added value when it comes to the methods that you're using? Well, we're, um, Rex, we're using five different criteria to all of which are equally weighted. And, you know, you look at Nielsen, your Saturday and Sunday time on, on television, uh, to Google search, to Meltwater, to, to MVP uh, index, and to, bear with me here, it's at the back of my head, I'll come up with it. But each of, the, each of these areas lead up to a player's ranking. And the bottom line, sorry? I believe Q rating. Q rating, yes. Q rating. Um, the bottom line is if you, if you look at any of those metrics, it's all about, for us, it's all about getting our players to engage in uh, our game, uh, help grow our tour, and help grow their own respective brands. And at the, if you look at what drives engagement, it's on course performance. Uh, and that's, that is, Part of the basis for the way the player impact program was developed, uh, you've seen how everybody's performed this year, um, you know. And I think as we look at it, uh, and you think about the the way that fans and the major storylines and the way fans have engaged, uh, players have engaged fans through those channels, I think it's 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 fairly intuitive. The point I would make is that, you know, we're up, you know, this year we're up 41 percent when you look at cross-channel consumption. We're up across every metric. And I think that's first and foremost because of the quality of play. But I also think we're benefiting from you know, some, some really powerful engagement from, from our players day to day in doing the things I just described. Thank you. Thank you. Next question back to Bob Herrick with ESPN. Jay, um, you kind of touched on some of this earlier, still having you know, to endure the pandemic issues. Um, any consideration to bringing testing back for the players and you know, support people or whatever on site uh, you know, when the new season begins? I think that, that um, the, the easiest way for me to answer that, Bob, is that you know, we're at, we need to respond to the realities of the pandemic. And ultimately for us, that's a matter of working with our medical expect, experts, continuing to follow CDC guidelines, and then most importantly, working very closely with local and state health officials or country health officials. And, and so, I mean, I think you're starting to see we, we do have some pre-event testing now, particularly when you're going into the international markets. Uh, based on where we are, we don't, in the short term, we don't see that as a need, uh, given where we are from a vaccination standpoint and where we are from our own protocols and their acceptance with those local and state health officials. But if we've learned one thing, um, you know, things could change with this pandemic. And for us, we'll be in a position to do what we think is going to ensure the health and safety of our players, fans, everybody that's uh, that's on site at our tournaments. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Back to Doug Ferguson. Hang on, sorry, Jay. A little slower to draw. The um, <clears throat> with some uncertainty with with uh, HSBC, not just this year. I'm not sure the length of the contract actually, and. and uh, can you just uh, give an idea of where you see the WGCs in the next few years? Uh, can you ever get to a point where, where Austin is is still a match play, just not a WGC? How would you answer that? I, I would, I would uh, 
We have two WGCs. It's unfortunate that uh, we're not going to be able to play in Shanghai. I expect that we will uh, be playing there as soon as it's acceptable, feasible to do so from a, from a pandemic standpoint. We, we feel like we've got a long-term commitment to that marketplace in the form of a WGC. Um, and you know, I, think, I think the same would hold true for, uh, for the Dell the WGC Dell match play. Uh, I, I don't. I think that those two events will continue to be um, World Golf Championships, certainly for the foreseeable future. And I think to answer your question, um, you know, we at, I, I see the WGCs continuing to play an important role in our schedule. But I also think you know that when you add, you know, our European Tour Strategic Alliance when you have an organization that's continuously challenging itself you know to you know to improve its product improve its schedule continue to provide the single greatest platform for top players in the world you know everything becomes in play when you're going through how you might get there so um you know unfortunately I, I, with certainty i can tell you that those two events are carrying forward in the long term i just think that the, we're going to continue to make them an important part of our consideration. Can you see adding one? Or can you get that one too? I, I, I could see adding one. I certainly could see that. Thank you. I, you know, I, I'd also say that it's, again, the reason that we're at two, when you go back to you know, our schedule announcement, was that the Northern Trust was not going to continue as our first FedEx Cup playoff event. That gave us an opportunity to initiate our FedEx Cup playoffs at TPC Southwind, which then led to the opportunity we had with the Genesis Scottish Open, the two opposite events, and what I think is a really strong sequence from that period, the three events leading into the FedEx Cup playoffs going forward. So that's kind of what the vagaries of the schedule create opportunities, openings, and, and, and decisions that we make to, and we always do it for, for the lens of what's What's the best possible schedule for players? Thank you, Jack. Thank you. All right, our last question is from Adam Shupak at Golf League. Hey, Jay. Um, hey, Adam. Could you confirm what, what Rex said, that it would, the PIP is going to be through the end of the year? I'm not sure you really answered that part of when, when he asked, brought that up. And also, is, is the quote unquote winner of this or the people that are, uh, you know, in the money, so to speak, is that ever going to be made public? It is through the end of the year. And we, we don't have any intention on, on, on publicizing it. Why is that? To, to us, it's, it's a, a program that we created, was created by our players, with our players, for our players. Um, and and that's, that's, that's what we decided that we were going to do when we created it. Okay. And um, on a scale of 1 to 10, with, with 1 being not at all and 10 being the apocalypse is upon us, how concerned are you that there could be a renegade tour starting in the next year or so? Adam, I'm 100% focused on our business. And, you know, excited to be here at the Tour Championship to complete this unbelievable season, to go into 2021, 2022 with not only an incredibly strong schedule with great committed tournaments, uh, but to be fully sponsored coming out of, coming through a pandemic. Uh, for us to have record consumption uh, over the course of this year, taking that momentum into next year, for the value of the platform that these players are continuing to play on, for that to continue to grow, for the close work and relationship we have with our players, um, and the way that we're going to continue to not only evolve our tort, but also evolve our game. Uh, I'm incredibly thankful for the charities and the fact that as we work through a pandemic, we're going to get back to or exceed numbers that we've had in the past. I'm incredibly thankful. I'm mean, proud of the fact that we've got these industry relationships that we're not only working very closely together to grow our respective events and tours, but they, together making a huge impact on our game. 
So that, that's what I, you know, that's what I have been focused on. That's what I'll continue to be focused on. And I think in life, you know, you, you always have to be cognizant of number one, there should be zero complacency to anything you do. And number two, someone is always going to try and do what, try, someone is always going to try and uh, take, compete and, and take something away from you. And I've operated that way every day of my life. And, and I think that's why with the great team I have surrounded by me, we're going to continue to grow this great tour. That be a not at all? I told you what I'm focused on. So it's, it's yeah, that, that's what I'm focused on. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. That concludes our Q&A, Jay, as always. Thank you for your time. And we appreciate our friends from the media joining as well. We look forward to seeing you and your coverage of the Tour Championship this week. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.